PMA, much more difficult. Class three, run for the hills. If your device is a class three, throw it in the, throw it in the garbage as you go and find something else. It's really tough. There's no substantial equivalence. There's no comparison. Everything stands on its own. You are yourself on this one here. It's much more expensive, as you can see here. For a 510K, it'll cost you $10,000 for the FDA to even look at it. For the FDA to look at your PMA, you're looking at $322,000. It's a little bit of a jump, right? And there's so much more that goes into it. Um, and it's much more time consuming. That guy holding his head, that's a real guy holding his head for run, you know, writing a PMA. There's two types, a traditional and modular, just so you know. Traditional is what you put it all together and send it to them and, and hope they choke on it all. Or the modular is where you're sending it in small pieces, right? And then that way they're able to work through it more, more efficiently and effectively. And modular is the way most companies are going now anyway, because it allows much more um, uh, conversation along the way. Then afterwards you get to do a device panel. You get to sit down with the FDA, literally sit down with them in front of you. And this is what it feels like. How many of you guys have ever had a bunch of monkeys throwing things at you? Well, I had a monkey eat some bread off my head once in Brazil, but nothing like this. And this is how it feels like. Now, here's the thing. With the FDA, in any conversation, regardless of the classification of your device, <laughs> will not be outnumbered, will not be outmanned, and will not be outsmarted. You cannot outsmart the FDA. I know. I've tried several times, and I felt like an idiot afterwards because I was outsmarted by them. You show up with a statistician, they'll show up with two PhD statisticians. You show up with the medical director of a hospital, they'll show up with two medical directors of a hospital and a university and an international organization, or three or four of them. You show up with a scientist that's like the expert in his field, they'll show up with the world-renowned experts in the same field. They will not be outmanned or outgunned or outsmarted. And they will have, and you do a design review with a small, if I were to have a meeting with the FDA with one, just one of your guys' teams, and we have a pre-submission meeting, they will call the branch division leader there, the branch chief there. They, they'll call these people there, and you're like, why are all these people taking time off to talk to us? We just wanted a simple question asked, answered. And the reason why, they will not be outsmarted or outmanned or outgunned. And so you cannot sneak anything by them. And this is sometimes how it feels. Is that you're, it's, it's quite intimidating sometimes. But the biggest thing with the PMA, and the most important thing to understand, is that with the PMA, you create a hurdle so hard and so high Remember how the class one, anybody and their dog can get into the, into the market with you and compete against you? Well, with the PMA, they cannot use you after you get it clear, after you get it approved. You can, no one else can use you as a predicate. You are your own device. If they want to come and get into your field that you're doing it in, they've got to go through all the misery and all the pain and all the heartbreak that you just went through and all the years that you just went through. There's no shortcut for a PMA for someone else. So that's the benefit of a PMA. Now, it is not wise to say, oh, well, let's make it a PMA to raise the hurdle. Because there's a lot that goes into, even if you want to modify it, oh, you've just created a nightmare and several more hundred thousand dollars in reviews just to make a small modification. So it's not in your best interest as a business to try making a PMA out of what's not a PMA. So where did all the predicates come from? <coughs> from other companies. Precedence has been set. So since 1976, they created a list of all the products that currently that they were aware of, and then they started building on those. So for example, imagine this right here. I've got a pen. I had this first company I worked with that I got laid off after six months, put a little LED on there with a blue light and a red light, and combined it looks violet. Stick it on a pimple. The blue light kills 70% of back, uh, acne causing bacteria. The red light increases the cellular communication, which causes the healing to happen much quicker. So that device is an LED acne tree treating device. Well, because some other dermatologist back way before then decided to get his approved, he got it approved for under that color and that, that type of device got approved under a laser surgical instrument. So the predicate now is a laser surgical instrument, but it's not a laser and it's not a surgical instrument, it's for treating acne. So it's been built on by precedence and over the years it's been, it's grown. So it's not a straightforward answer, but that's kind of how it works. So I mean I think partly what he was getting at is things sometimes do move from class three to class two, right? Yeah. If they've been around for a while. Not, it's not because they've been around for a while, it's if they've become better understood or the risks have been reduced by a new technology that it may be down classified. Very rare to get one that's gone from three to two, um, but it does happen. Go look at the Federal Registrage and you'll see it on there. I'm uh, helping you to make a point with this question. Uh, is it substantially equivalent by form or function or design? And uh, to make an example, is a laser scalpel substantially equivalent to a steel scalpel? They are not substantially equivalent because the mechanism of actions are different. So the technologies are different. Yeah. And so there's a lot, so, so that substantial equivalence argument 
is the crutch of everything. And all that comes down to is the one thing, and I didn't put it on here too much, is called the indications for use. And that's where, you'd, that's where all of this really comes to play, is, is determining that form fit function and all of that. So does that answer your question, though? OK. Anyway, so PMAs, you get an approval. You stood your ground. You fought off the monkeys. You get an approval. 510Ks, you get a clearance, not an approval. You're just cleared to market. They did not approve you for your safety and effectiveness. And there's a typical PMA. All right, here's some, some uh, basic uh, comparisons. 180-day approval, which is a lie. It's more like two years. 90-day approval for a 510K, again, it's a lie. That's FDA days. If they ask you a question, the clock stops. Six months pass, you resubmit. They, you know, they give you a question on day 41. You'd wait two, three months to answer. You send it back two, three months later, and now you're on day 42. So it's FDA days that they're actually looking at it. So it could take much more than just the actual 90 days, but it's 90 review days. Then an IDE, you're just making it, so this is the next type of submission, you're just making a determination if your device is significant risk or non-significant risk. That's all we're going to talk about here, really. We'll, you, you know, if you need more information on that, we can talk in specifics, but that's really what it comes down to, is, is if you're a high risk or low risk device when you're using it.